Welcome everyone to Faith United Online. Glad to have you here with us this week. Um, you may notice I've got my uh, little Ohio Vote It badge on, uh, which means I have gone to the polls. And it's just something I do really want to encourage everyone to uh, take the opportunity and uh, use your right to vote and um, hit the polls. You can do it early like we did in Wood County. We went down to Bowling Green. I know there are other early voting stations and make sure you're, you get your vote in and that you are counted. Now that we have that public service announcement out of the way, uh, it's wonderful to have you here at Faith United Online for our online worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children. And Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Let us pray. God of compassion, by the power of God, Elijah provided bread and oil for the widow and her household. By faith in God, the widow provided food and water for Elijah. Give us hearts to love one another so that in providing and in receiving, 
we too might experience the unimaginable power of God through the one who has provided life itself, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. A reading from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the lowly hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction and the Lord heard me and saved me from my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. The lions are in want and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. O Lord, you redeem the life of your servants, and those who put their trust in you will not be punished. So God has a lot of nicknames uh, in the Bible. God is called uh, our shield, our protector, our rock, our provider. And it's interesting to me that while God is called a God of provision in the Old Testament, he's not called a God of abundance. And what we've seen so far is that God gives us what we need. He does not always give us what we want. And that seems to be a huge difference between provision and abundance to me. And today is another story that illustrates that. Hopefully, we will learn something of God's provision and God's abundance as we look at 1 Corinthians, the 17th chapter. Let's start at the first verse. Now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, who, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, as we often do uh, when we're looking at these uh, narrative stories from the Old Testament, we need to kind of back up to see what led us to this point. 
Now this is about a hundred years after King David. And at this point, the people of Israel have split into two different kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, which for instance is where Jerusalem is located, would be in the southern kingdom of Judah. In each kingdom, the kings are by and large immense failures in the eyes of God. And our story today takes place in, place in the northern kingdom and on the throne is one of the worst of all of the kings, Ahab. Archaeology actually indicates that he was one of the wealthiest and most successful of all the kings. Israel was in these days abundant under the rule of Ahab, but he was a corrupt and ruthless ruler that showed a contempt for God. Among other things, he married a woman from Sidon named Jezebel, and she was so awful that her name has become synonymous with a repugnant and immoral woman, a Jezebel. One of the things Ahab and Jezebel did was to mix the religions that she practiced into the worship of God. And moreover, under his role, the people also adopted these practices. So for all of these sins of Ahab and the people, the Lord committed to showing them that for all their abundance, they would learn that the Lord gives and the Lord can take away. So God tells Elijah, his prophet, to announce to Ahab that there would be a drought until God said otherwise. But in the midst of this drought, how would God take care of his prophet? Well, let's see. Verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the Wadi, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the wadi. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. Now, Elijah is told to travel 30 miles to a wadi. That's not an unsubstantial distance when you're most likely walking. And he is going there to hide because his life is in jeopardy for delivering the message about the drought to Ahab. He is also sent there because there's water. Now, what is a wadi? Wadis are kind of amazing things, and you can actually find a video of wadis uh, on the internet if you want to take a look for them. But they can appear to be in either completely dry ravine or almost like a dry path through the desert. And when it rains in the distant mountains, rain can pour down off of these mountains and then fill these wadis, making sudden rivers. They, they, they result in flash floods that provide water in a desert when there hasn't been any rain for miles and miles and miles. Well, that's what a wadi is, and that's where Elijah is sent. And Elijah is told to hide there and drink from the wadi. God also tells him that he's going to send ravens to help him. Now, that's an interesting thing. You see, ravens were considered to be unclean. They're carrion birds eating the flesh of dead and decaying animals. And a devout Jew following the law shouldn't have contact with such things. And yet God chooses these birds to provide to Elijah, God's prophet. God is teaching Elijah an important lesson, and it's an important lesson for all of us to hear and understand. God will sometimes provide in ways and from sources 
you would not expect. So God provides to Elijah. But it's not abundance, is it? It is drinking water from a muddy river and food delivered by dirty birds. But it's enough. That is, until it runs out. The wadi dries up and God once again speaks to to Elijah, picking up at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, Make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not empty, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. God once again provides. And once again, there's irony in the way that God does it. Elijah's told to go to a widow in Sidon. This time he has to travel about 50 miles to the very place the evil queen Jezebel came from, the pagan city of Sidon. And it is there that he's told he will find help in the person of a widow. Now, widows were among the most destitute of all people in the ancient Middle East. Because of the culture, they had no way to provide for themselves. This widow is literally scrounging for sticks to make her last meal from her last little bit of meal and oil. She too is affected by this drought and she anticipates that she and her son are in fact going to die. Now this foreigner asks for her to give him his last meal bit of food. Elijah tells her that the Lord will not let her run out of it until it rains. But she doesn't even believe in the Lord. And we know this because she addresses Elijah saying, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing. But amazingly, she takes him in. She takes this foreigner in and her food sustains them. We're going to pick up at verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him into the upper chamber where he was lodging and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, you have brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son. And then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, 
Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. God once again provides, but even here, God's provision is not without limits, is it? I mean, at some point, death will come knocking again. We don't know when. For this boy, it could have been a year or a hundred years. We don't know. Yet this does not rob God's provision of its power or its goodness. In fact, I think it teaches us something of the nature of provision and abundance. In the Bible, and I would say therefore in life, we don't usually see God give the things of this world in abundance. When it comes to the things of this world, God provides. He does not lavish. Why? Here's what I, what I would say I've learned from God through Scripture. When God provides today, it requires faith that God will provide tomorrow. And faith is a greater gift than abundance. When God gives manna to the people of Israel, they are given enough for the day. They learned to have faith that God would once again provide in the morning. Elijah is told to travel great distances and to expect provision in very unexpected ways and places. It took faith to set out on those journeys. But Elijah's faith in God's provision was so grounded that he could even ask and expect God to return life to a dead child. Abundance in this life, unfortunately, often only serves to create a false confidence in ourselves and an apathy in our trust for God. And when that happens, we may find ourselves like Ahab, needing to be reminded that the Lord gives and the Lord can take away. Now, the Bible does speak of God's abundance, though. For instance, in Psalm 51, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. In the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes, If because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise domain, dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. As Christ said in the parable of the rich fool, in Luke chapter 15, one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. God demonstrates his abundance in the things that are eternal. Love, mercy, life, grace. In many ways, our world seems to have these things in short supply, especially it seems in our day and age. And so God's abundance overcomes our greatest poverty. And with that in mind, my prayer for you is that you may find faith in everything that God provides and experiences abundance in the places that truly matter. Amen.
Lord of all the saints, we praise you for evangelists and martyrs whose sacrifices witness to your gospel across time and space. Inspire us by their courage to carry our faith to new people and places around us. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of every place, the universe proclaims your greatness from generation to generation. Bless the work of naturalists, conservationists, and park rangers who train our attention to the wonders of the world you have made. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of every nation, guide this country, red states and blue states, rural voters and urban voters, young and old, as we share in another national election. Kindle hearts eager to understand our common needs and seek our common good. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Lord of every blessing, your son's blessing came to those living with poverty, grief, hunger, thirst, and persecution. Shape our vision of the saints to match their own. Awaken in us your call to serve all who suffer. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Lord of every venture, anoint us with the missionary spirit of the early church. Bless all new missions of our synod. Empower testimony from new communities of faith to shape a diverse witness to your saving power. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of every time, countless are the multitudes you have called by name and gathered to yourself. Comfort us as we grieve those who have died in the past year, especially Les Johnson, Pat Finnegan, Marie Gillen, Harry Schrader, Richard DeLeonis. In faith, may we join with them in ceaseless praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to Faith United Online. I hope you'll take a minute and subscribe. And if you've done that already, hit the notification bell so that you'll know when new videos come live. And if you've enjoyed this message, uh, please take a moment, give it a thumbs up and share it with someone else that you think might benefit from hearing this word of God. God bless. Have a great week. Keep safe.